And in 2015, we sold the UK side, which was a huge, well, huge for us, sorry, business part of what we did. And so when that went, it, I think looking back, I felt like I had a bit of a, a gap, a bit of a hole to fill, you know. And the Ironman, the, the UK route, the Ironman went past my house, like literally past my drive on Great Lane in Croston. And I've seen it over the years and I'm always inspired by, you know, big events and particularly Ironman because it's cool, isn't it? You watch these people fly past you in the, in the drop bars and you think, wow, that's awesome. You know, I could do that. And being an all or nothing, I'm like, well, you know, if I can do an Olympic, I can definitely do an Ironman. So I'm just immediately going to sign up. So I got talked to heaps here and he was like, yes, well, now we're talking. And he just convinced me to sign up. And I don't know when this was. It could have been over Christmas 2017 to do it in 2018. So I'm in, right? I'm signed up with you guys. And I'm like, right, well, okay. I'm doing the nine man then in whatever, eight months, nine months time. So that, so that was that then. And then that became, you know, an extension of my identity that, well, I'm an nine man in training now. That is age grouper Gareth Whittle talking about his inspiration for signing up for Ironman UK. And this is an episode of Age Group Stories brought to you by the Oxygen Addict Triathlon Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Oxygen Addict Triathlon Podcast. We're brought to you every week by our sponsors, PrecisionHydration.com. Electrolytes in different strengths that match how you sweat. You can get 15% off your first order with the code OxygenAddict15. Hey everybody, happy new year. I hope you're good. I hope you all have had a restful bit of holiday or break time or family time or whatever it is you've managed to do during the last couple of weeks. I um, hope you've enjoyed the couple of replays that we've played for you during the time I've been having a bit of a break. I've got to say, I have uh, vastly enjoyed having a little bit of time off and having a bit of time to recharge the batteries. And we are back on it at 100% here, ready in 2021 to move on forwards. So, how you doing? Crazy bit of news with us being back in lockdown three at the moment, isn't it? I hope you all are dealing okay with that kind of news. Um. I wanted to kick off today by talking about that a little bit and just saying, look, be aware in your training that everybody in the country is under a huge amount of stress, <laughs> whether we like to admit it or not. All of a sudden, you know, whether it's you've got extra kids in the house, there's extra pressures at work, the homeschooling thing, we have to face the fact that it's a very, very challenging time, very, very stressful time having all of these things that feel out of our control going on with lockdown. And that is, by necessity, it's going to have a knock-on effect onto how we feel, onto how our bodies feel, onto the level of stress that we're under. And as you know from listening to the HRV interview, our body cannot distinguish between emotional stress, physical stress, training stress. It knows it all just as stress. So, how this relates to your training, kind of what I want to say to you here is give yourself a bit of a break over the next couple of weeks in terms of chasing numbers, chasing power, chasing pace. Remember that if, you know, if you're not measuring your HRV, I highly recommend you know, download the app and start tracking your HRV at the moment. If you are, lots of our athletes have reported seeing HRV scores that are amber or red, meaning reduce intensity or take extra rest days. It's just a given, even if you're not measuring your HRV at the moment. It's a given that because we're under more stress at the moment, that our bodies are going to be less able to absorb really hard training stress. So, you know, just give yourself the break. Reduce your FTP targets by 10%. Knock a little bit off the pace. Go and exercise for fun. Go and exercise for stress relief. Try and get outdoors in the sunlight as much as you possibly can if that's allowed in your area. Just try and give yourself that little bit of a break. And... I think the big takeaway message is it's great to have a training plan. It's great to have a roadmap of where you want to get to for the, the coming season, the coming summer. But just remember that getting any training done at all is better than getting no training done. So if it's just a 30-minute spin on the bike or an easy 20-minute jog outside, that is 90% better than getting nothing done at all. So don't beat yourself up if you can't reach the numbers or if you you know, you don't feel like you want to do a hard session. I think that's perfectly normal, perfectly reasonable. Give yourself that bit of space to relax into the lockdown. And, you know, in a week or two, it's going to feel like the new normal and things are going to be a lot, sort of a lot brighter and a lot easier. 
So we're kicking off this year with an age group special. This is an interview with one of our athletes, Gareth Whittle. Gareth has, has you know, gone on to become a really good friend of mine. I do a lot of training with Gareth and talk to him often. Gareth's got a great story. He entered um, his first duathlon for a laugh on a bit of a bet with a friend. He, in his own words, was you know quite a lot more overweight than he really wanted to be. He entered this and he got stuck in and he was just bitten by the duathlon and the triathlon bug and it became a thing that gave him a sense of identity. So we've got a great story of someone who comes into the sport from nowhere, completes an Ironman. He, he did Ironman UK as his first one, mainly because he'd seen the race coming by the end of his road and thought it looked amazing. But then the story later on turns into an amazing, quite quite ridiculous Bear grill style story of survival when him and some friends go away on an adventure and go to uh, an Alaskan skidoo trip and end up getting separated from the guides, getting caught in a ridiculously cold, freezing cold storm, all of them at severe risk of, um, well, actually getting frostbite and at severe risk of losing limbs, losing fingers, toes, feet. And the story of how he gets through that and comes back to compete in triathlon again. So it's an amazing story of resilience. I really hope that you take something from listening to it and take some of the lessons from what Gareth talks about and maybe apply that to the situation we find ourselves in at the moment with lockdown. So without further ado, here we go to this week's interview of the week with Gareth Whittle. All right, Gaz, welcome to the show. It's, it's great to have you on. We've hit record. We're officially rolling. We how are you doing rolling. today? Good to be on. Yeah, really good. How are you? Yeah, good, mate. Good. good so good. we've got to we've got to tell your story to the listeners. So a bit of background for people. Yeah. Who are We're probably closer mates than anybody that I've interviewed for the show yeah. before. So there's going to be a you know we know each other pretty well on a on a sort of social and having had crazy adventures together kind of kind of level. Yeah. Um. So I guess the thing to do is to get across your story so everyone everyone kind of hears it from the beginning because the person you were before I met you is very different to the person that you are to now. And in some ways it's also very similar. So let's, let's go right back to the start of your triathlon journey or multi-sport journey. When did you first start getting into doing? Yeah, I think I can trace multi-sport back to about 2010, right? right? So very quick history pre that never been a particularly sporty person as such. Uh, and any sports that I did tended to be sort of solo things. So I wasn't a team sports kind of guy at school or anything like that, right? Um, but I've always been in, t- I've always had a bike of some description, yeah, be it BMX or when I got a bit older, it was ma- mountain biking for a while. It still is on occasion. I do love that and what we've been out, haven't we? So, you know, that's fun. So I've always rode a bike to some level or other. And then I met my wife, Babs, uh, through my work, right? And we employed her as a sales manager. And- <laughs> <laughs> probably didn't sp- I don't know how this sounds but I ended up marrying the, someone who I employed but anyway <laughs> over the years we were getting to know each other I kept hearing as, his as name the, he- as the phrase goes somewhere in the distance yeah. a lawyer's phone rings <laughs> I know yeah yeah I'm just checking that um it all works out fine you know but so as we're getting to know each other uh, you know you meet you, you the social groups going I've come across this guy called Heapsy Andy Heaps and I kept hearing these ridiculous stories about oh he's done this this weekend and he's going doing that and you know, he did, he did this ridiculous food challenge and tried to eat as many cream eggs as he could in a minute. You know, I'm like, who is this guy? Like, he's an absolute idiot. Anyway, I then meet him and find out that he's into triathlon, right, which is, you know, something new to me, something I knew about I'd never done. Couldn't swim, just about ride a bike, a horrific runner, right? It's just not so totally unrelatable to anything that I ever did. My, my background is martial arts, which I got into from probably when I was about 10. Okay. Until late twenties, so I did. I did an excessive amount of martial arts. Do you know, I did not know that about you. Did you not? Oh, no. mate, what, yeah, what I, martial I did arts it. did you do? Oh, many. Started out in karate, and then once I got my uh, my instructor belt, my black belt in that, I then branched out into Thai boxing, Filipino martial arts. Uh, then I love this. Oh, casually, <laughs> casually <laughs> throws in the black belt. I like it. Okay, so then oh, there's yeah, never any trouble. For, I did it for, you know, 20 years or something. So, so I got really into it, you know, like yeah. I'm an all or nothing person, as you know, right? So I ended up doing it five, six times a week and just ridiculous. So that's my background. Anyway, so I meet Heapsy and he's telling me about he's going off doing this 24-hour mountain bike event. He's doing whatever. 
we should go mountain biking one day. I'm like, yeah, cool, that'd be great. I mean, that was an eye opener for a start, right, as you well know. Then he talked about this duathlon in Langdegla. Now, I've been to Langdegla at the mountain bike centre. I was like, that sounds cool. What is it? Is that like, it's just basically run, bike, run. I'm like, oh, cool, I can do that. I'm a black belt. I'm invincible. I can do what I want. Right. And at this point, I'm, I'm a good 15 kilos heavier than I am now at this point. Right. Horrifically undertrained and overconfident. So I turn up at Langdegla with heaps and a few others who I saw that I also knew from doing what we do. Like there's a few bartenders there because I sold, I used to sell beer for a living. Right? I'm like, mm, this seems, <laughs> this seems more daunting than I was expecting. And we set off on the run and, and it was not even a big event. I don't even know what it is. It's like 4k and 6k runs or something with the bike, the 20k bike, something like that in between. Horrific day, raining, cold. Did the first run. Like, I'm almost dropping down dead. And I'm like, oh my God, I've still got the bike to do. Came in virtually last on the first segment. Then did the bike and overtook a good few people. That was a confidence boost. And I thought, well, you know, it's not so bad. Then I sat off for the, for the last run segment and people are literally packing up and getting in the cars and, you know, wishing me luck. And I was like, well, this, this isn't great. I set off, do one loop round the run and off I go back, think like, thank you, my lucky stars, it's over. And one of the marshals went, you all right, mate? Have you been twice round? I thought, you what? He's like, have you been twice? And I laughed at him thinking he was joking. And he was like, no, I'm serious. You've got to go twice. Right? So I genuinely almost burst into tears. I just got <laughs> off at 100 kilos for my second, second lap round this run course. And I got back and honestly, like Babs was a look of concern on her face. I'll never forget. And heaps of little just comical, just collapsed in laughter at the sight of me. I was like, this is awful. So I I'll try to make some notes this morning so I get my, my time injury right. But I honestly think that was the last endurance I did, event I did for about five years. It was just right. awful. Yeah. Horrific, horrific. I mean, it was such a wake up that one, you can't just turn up to events and think, think you're going to, you know, do well. And two, you're not a runner. And <laughs> I'm not too sure whether you will be ever. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was just a lesson in, uh, you got to prepare for these things, you know, you, you can't just rock up and expect to do well. It's, it's interesting is that you can be, you can be very, very good at something. You can be a black belt in karate. And obviously that, I mean, I don't know. I've, I couldn't fight my way out of a wet paper bag, mm. but I'd imagine it gives you a ton of confidence in, in any kind of, Oh, absolutely. In any kind of like confrontational or any kind of situation. Any situation. Yes. That, that's yeah. the beauty of martial arts. I came from a, well, I wouldn't say I was bullied, but it, I, I was definitely more on the, sort of more vulnerable side at school okay I'm six foot two and like a big big lad but i don't know it just that's just the way my life panned out. i was a lot oh. very shy kid kids are cruel uh, aren't they yeah oh, it's cruel. school can be cruel can't it? yeah so i got into martial arts and it and it transformed my character and you yeah. just carry this confidence with you you know which which transcends into everything so it's fantastic for that but it does also breed a bit of overconfidence in your <laughs> uh, your sporting ability i think <laughs> so yeah uh, that was uh, well look look back me. a little bit then i suppose yeah. to to fill the readers in, you're, you know, you were 100 kilos then. You're a lot closer to 80 now. Yes. Yeah. How's, how's life different for someone who, because very few people go through that transformation of being 100 kilos or being very bloody fit and being closer to 80. Mm, mm. How, how is life as a carrying an extra 15, 20 kilos on your frame? How, how are things different? Well, aside from the, the obvious things like clothes and shopping, you're like, I'm, as I said, I'm quite tall, so I, I wasn't one of those people that people one of those people that I get pointed at and like, my God, look at the size of him because I'm I'm tall enough to carry it off. Yeah. But it, it's when you get thrown into uh, doing like a little run or a bike ride, and you go out with others who are perhaps aren't your weight, and they perhaps do a bit more training, they're a bit you know physically fitter, and you get really shown up very quickly. And for someone of my uh, temperamental ego let's say that's not great you know and then you get like you know it's the odd it's comical but like i remember a few years well around that sort of time i went to new zealand with work with um Kieran and chris and my business partners and we did the bungee jumps you know the the three bungee jumps that you can do there oh okay yeah yeah amazing experience but not one to be repeated anyway i step up and the, and the guys organized go here he is a big fella bring out the big rat <clears throat> and excuse me i'm like they had to bring out like a different band for me, you know, from the others. And I was like, oh my God, I'm really? like, not that big. Like, Look at the size of you. <laughs> I'm like, oh. So there are things like that that happen. Silly things, but it does prey on your mind, I think, if you're being honest with yourself, going, 
perhaps this isn't okay you know, where, where, where I need to be. And then I don't actually know what the wake up call was, other than probably that duathlon was a starting point of you, you, you could do some work here, you know, right. or you need yeah. to do. Some, and then as you get older, as, you, as we were talking about before, you know, with age comes ailments, and that isn't helped if you're carrying around 15 kilos of timber. Yeah. You know? yeah. Uh, and then just wanting to be all you can be. So, you know, you get into biking and biking with all that extra weight is not easy, is it? So, biking and running both of them. It's, well, a, it's run, a very, I mean, well, very simple equation, isn't it? it? It really is, yeah. Yeah. I think so, yeah, so that, the, that's, that's the difference, really. Yeah. You have more energy, don't you? More energy and just more zest for life, I think. Um, right. So, from, from 2010 onwards, then, you've, yeah. you've had the duathlon experience. What was the point when? when you got the tipping point of deciding, right, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of start taking the endurance sports triathlon type stuff a bit more seriously. When did that yeah, come around? Uh, yeah. I don't know exactly, but it, it's, it's an ongoing association with, with Andy yeah. and him, him doing things. And then obviously, you know, getting involved with yourself and building that business. So I, I've, I've got a, a connection to that side of, uh, of life that I didn't previously. I'd always ridden bikes uh and you know like most or seemingly nowadays anyway most lads who reach 30 plus decide to get a, either a shiny carbon bike or a set of golf clubs right and seemingly more increasingly people are going for the biking so i'd got a road bike and i started doing less and less martial arts because i, I was just having too many injuries and i was driving around all over the country all the time to get to different events and it was just too much uh work had really kicked up a gear and um, so the businesses I'm involved with have grown quite quickly. So biking became like a, a go-to Sunday morning thing that I could do to clear my head. I'm, I'm one of those people, like probably most of us, that has to exercise. And if I don't exercise, I'm not a very nice person to be around. That's how I, it's how I process day-to-day stress, I think. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm one of those weird people that really looks forward to and enjoys beasting myself on a Zwift session or something, you know. So yeah. it works for me. So I got into biking and then through association with Heapsy and him, his involvement with you, we got chatting, I think, and you might correct me on this, but I'm sure we're around at my house talking about triathlons and he convinced me over a few beers, as he tends to do, to get involved and sign up to Slate Man, right? So as first triathlons go, I mean, that, that's unpleasant, isn't it, as an as a, as a introduction? Baptism of ice rather Absolutely. than... Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that, I mean, yeah. I mean, nothing's as bad as the duathlon at Langdegler, clearly. Right? That, I mean, that's the pinnacle of any, any suffering as far as I'm concerned. And that's now the barometer that me heaps use. Yeah, but was it as bad as Langdegler? Well, obviously not. No, can't be. <laughs> um, but yeah, the Slate Man was everything it, it promised to be. Freezing cold, wet, and grueling, you know. Um, and as I've alluded to, I'm no runner. Uh, so running up a Slate Man isn't easy after biking around Windermere in the rain. So. Uh, and I couldn't swim at that point, so most of the swim was breaststroke. I even right. went on my back at one point, did a bit of backstroke. So you know, it was uh, it was interesting. But you know, I finished it, and after I got over the shock of it, I did reflect and go, you know what, that's enjoyable. I enjoyed the mental challenge of it, which I think is a major part of what attracts me about attracts me to a triathlon. You know, it's the mental challenge of it that I like. That's that's like the reoccurring theme, isn't it? It's the going towards the things that going towards the things that scare you seems yeah. to oh, be. Yeah. Um, that's definitely. What sort of year was this then, Slate Man? Good question. I'm going to say it was 2017. Okay. Yeah, so it's a good few years after Langdegler. Um, but as I say, I'd managed to lose a bit of weight by then and get yeah. more involved in endurancey type stuff. Uh, I don't remember. I think I might have even done a couple of half marathons, you know, like Manchester half and stuff. So okay. I'd obviously dip my toe into endurance stuff. And then it just took a few beers and heaps of to <laughs> persuade me to sign up, you know. I mean, it's a daunting experience, isn't it? Your first triathlon. Like, yeah. Standing, standing, waiting to jump into the water, particularly, you know, it's 30 degrees or whatever it was. You know, that's, you know, you've got a yeah. wetsuit on for the first time and all that. I mean, it's full on. It's a, it's a, it's a major thing. That, funnily enough, that was my my first uh, triathlon was was in the same lake. It was uh, yeah, they had the, the original Half Ironman UK was held there, right? Um, and so I've got a very similar 
<laughs> Some of the of standing ankle deep in the water, just going, I cannot believe how cold this is. Yeah. I, I, Surely cannot be expecting us to swim all the way to where those yellow boys yeah, are. Exactly. You're like, really? Is that, can that be right? And that shot when you dive in, you know, you lose your breath and then you panic and then you swallow water. All those <laughs> amateur things that we all do, you know, it's all part of it, isn't it? But what, what, a, what a day that was, yeah. And then later that same day, that same day, that same, that would be impressive, wouldn't it? The same year, I did um, Castle Howard. Right. You know, the, um, the, the Castle series. And that was like a spa day in comparison. It was <laughs> a, lot, a lot warmer, a lot more genteel, uh, just an overall more pleasant experience, cause, partly because I knew what was coming and, and partly because it was just less harsh conditions, you know. So, and from, I think from then, that then sealed it. It was like, right, this is what you do now. You're a triathlete. You know, and I, I, I sort of like that. I like having an identity that you can sort of sign up to and go, right, that's what I'm part of now. I say I'm all or nothing. And I think I think there's a lot of that in our sport, actually. It's interesting you say that because mm. I've not heard anyone articulate it as well as that before, but I think there's a, we like an identity and, and triathlon really? is something we can, we can take on and be like, well, well this is what I am. I'm a person yeah. who does triathlons and yeah. trains on what the weather is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's, it's really important to me that I don't know why, but it is. I need to know that I, I, I do something and I'm standing for something. It's part of my identity. So when people ask, what do you do? Oh, well, I'm an entrepreneur and I do this. Oh, and also I'm a triathlete, you know. And despite what I might have done in my business career, all the talk with everyone, you know, when you meet new people, it's always about triathlons in terms of people want, asking me, you know, I try not to be one of those typical men that, you know, how do you, how do you find out? who's done an Ironman and who's not, don't worry, they'll tell you type of thing. (laughs) So I try not to do that, but anyone new you meet and you tell them what you're into, they never really focus on the businesses or whatever I might have done investments-wise. It's always about triathlon. And I quite like that, you know, because it's good to have a story to tell, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. With ourselves. Well, the obvious next question then is, you know, you're all in after you do Slate Man. Now your identity is a triathlete. So the obvious next step is when do you enter your first Ironman? Well, the, the, the minute that you give Andy heaps of beer and, and talk about <laughs> and talk about it. So, so in 2015, I sold uh, the U, a UK part of my business. Where, uh, so I distributed a, a cider from Sweden called Record League. And in 2015, we sold the UK cider, which was a huge, well, huge for us, sorry, business part of what we did. And so when that went, it, I, I think looking back, I felt like I had a bit of a, a gap, a bit of a hole to fill, you know. And the Ironman, the, the UK route, the Ironman, went past my house, like literally past my drive on Great Lane in Croston. And I've seen it over the years, and I'm always inspired by, you know, big events, and particularly Ironman, because it's cool, isn't it? You watch these people fly past you in the, in the drop bars, and you think, wow, that's awesome. You know, I could do that. And being an all or nothing, I'm like, well, you know, if I can do an Olympic, I can definitely do an Ironman, so I'm just immediately going to sign up. So I got talked to heaps here and he was like, yes, well, now we're talking. And he just convinced me to sign up. And I don't know when this was. It could have been over Christmas 2017 to do it in 2018. So I'm in, right? I'm signed up with you guys. And I'm like, right, well, okay. I'm doing the nine man then in whatever, eight months, nine months time. So that, so that was that then. And then that became, you know, an extension of my identity that, well, I'm an nine man in training now. So I'm, and then I'm obsessing about doing that, and and that became it. And then my world changed because then I had to move to Australia for what seven, eight months for work. So I then had to defer. Um, right. Okay. So I got to That's do it fun. in 2018, which is uh, and that was I think that was the year that the, the fires wasn't it, and they had to amend the bike route. Yeah. 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 So, so I missed right. that. Yeah. Uh, so I ended up not doing a lot of events in 2018, but I still carried on the training out in Australia. Uh, so I've got a mate over there who, who'd done, well, two mates actually, one of them used to work with us, as a um, got a personal training business, and he did cans. So we sort right, of, okay. I, I, I piggybacked on his training and just made sure I kept my, my eye in, you know, yeah. as best I could. Uh, but yeah, that's, that was a bit of a weird year in terms of progression. You've done Slate, man. You've done Castle Howard. You, you're identified as a triathlete and then you don't do any events because you right. move to the other side of the world. So, so that yeah. was, uh, that was a, an interesting year. But I managed to defer and then it was, just, it was sort of ready, for, ready and waiting for me when I came back ready for 2019. 
Did you have a pretty clear memory then of, because when you say that the route of Ironman UK goes past the end of your driveway, it, it literally does, like the road at oh, the end of your driveway is yeah. closed one day a year as yeah. well, what 2,000, 2,000 people zoom by, right? So yeah, yeah. did you used to wander down the path and watch more go by? Oh, yeah, we, we'd get the deck chairs out. We'd have the cowbells. I'd be handing <laughs> out Maltlo, you know, Soreen. And yeah, yeah. And then over the years, I've, I've known, you know, two or three people who were doing it. So we'd wait and stand and cheer. In fact, so back, so yeah, seventeen, maybe seventeen. A personal trainer I had at the time, he entered it. Okay. So he entered it for the second time. So I was looking out for Dan coming past, and then he saw me on the second loop round, and he's, he had this look of just horror on his face. You know, he's a fit guy. And I thought, well, do it for the second time. He's out to you know break some records here for himself. And I thought he didn't look right. I cheered him on, and then we walked back up up the lane back to our house. And he was waiting for me outside my outside the gates. Oh, no. I was like, oh no, mate, what's happened? He's like, oh, on the second lap, he was. I mean, he was in tears. He was mortified, bless him. But he he was on a um, a feed station, and the person in front of him stopped rather than slowed down. So he, I know, yeah. So so he went into the back of this person, came off, smashed himself up, broke his gear, all that. Oh no! So he persevered, tried tried to like you know battle through, but he just couldn't do it. So, yeah, so I ended up driving him home that day, which is a real shame. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, so, but it just strengthened my life. I need to do this, you know. Like, yeah. This is me all over, uh, you know. <laughs> I can see myself being an Iron Man and how cool will that be? So, yeah, I came back thinking, well, it's going to be brilliant because I'm going to have loads of spectators. I'm going to go past my house and it's going to be great. I can wave to my wife and my two kids and, and then they changed the route. <laughs> <laughs> and it went nowhere near my house. They made it hillier and nowhere near. So I was like, oh, great. So, yeah, so that... <laughs> So that kind of changed things, but you know. Anyway, it's uh, it wasn't the end of the world. It was still great. Well, you know, you, you, you've been out enough times. The crowd's always amazing there, and you know, I got the support anyway. But, uh, I was going to say you got to be careful what you wish for because maybe having the bike route go by your own front drive when you're really hurting at ninety well, miles you know what? or whatever might not yeah, be such a I, such a great thing. There's a so when I was training um, on the long runs, there's a route that I can do. If I go out my my house, do this route and come back, it's exactly thirteen point one miles, right? So, so on the long run, you know, whatever you build, it's three hours, don't you? Now I'm not the fastest runner in the world, so three hours for me is like one and a half, uh, whatever it would be, you know. Yeah, twenty miles. Twenty miles, let's call it. Yeah. So you get you go there and back, and I'm stood outside my gates, thinking mm, I've got to turn around and go back again. Yeah, like and that psychological like toughness you need to not just call in and go well it's enough two hours is enough it, it, it's, it's good for me it was good training um so yeah, yeah it works it works all right for me stuff like that i'm one of those i like i like a route that's laps i like counting down you know some people don't do it they mm. don't like it do they whereas i, they, I, I prefer them because in my yeah. head i tick them down and yeah. go, right, that's one to go two you know whatever yeah it yeah i'm the same better. actually oh, yeah. I, i'm yeah. much happier doing yeah i almost get a kind of perverse pleasure from telling myself I'm going to quit at the end of this lap. And yeah. then as the end of the lap comes yeah, up, yeah. So I've gone, well, actually, you probably got to come and just turn around. and just Exactly. Yeah, it's it's good that. mental training to just head off again in another yeah. direction, isn't I'm it? Exactly the same, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so as I say, it didn't come past my house, but, I, you know, I did the training on that route, on the old route. So, so I did tick the box of being able to go past my, my own house on the drop bars, you know, and pretend I'm a cool lion man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's just no one to watch that's all but, uh, so, yeah talking about before we talk about the race itself let's talk about mm. i think one of the interesting things is how people balance the training that they've the trend that they want to do with the work that they have to do yeah. and th there's everything in the sort of the guy who goes to work at nine every day and comes back at five every day and yeah. then there's people who work crazy shifts and how they fit it in talk us through sort of what your what your week looks like if what routine there is to it and then how you fit your training in around that. Yeah. So, so in one sense, I'm very lucky in that I'm self-employed, right? I, I, so how best to describe what I do. I, I'm a co-owner of a, a few different businesses. One's the record league side that I told you about where we import ciders to various parts of the world. Uh, um, well now it's less than it was because we've sold off a few places including the UK, Australia, but you know, so, so, Lots of different time zones and lots of different challenges depending on the country. Mm. Another one is um, 
we've just launched another alcohol brand in Australia called Saintly. I'll get that little plug in there. <laughs> um, and that's new and it's only in Australia. But again, you know, you, you're dealing with sort of time zone things really as much as anything. Uh, and then another business I have a, a, a sort of help run, uh, which is more the day job now, is Farmers On, which is an online butcher's which sells heritage breed grass-fed meat. Uh, and then the other stuff I do is, is sort of seed investment. So I've got a number of, of investments that I and my business partners make in startup businesses in various different industries, right? And then it can be from finance technology through to personal training through to water bottles that are a water bottle and a foam roller in one, stuff like, you know, like a whole range of things, but you're investing in the idea in the people. You're a dragon. You're, that's what you are. I, uh, yeah, you're a, you're I'm a dragon, dragon without dragon. a fame or a TV uh, contract. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So very varied. Very sort of. Um, uh, I don't know. It's kind of, it can be stressful, but it's also really enjoyable at times. But it's a lot of plates to spin for different reasons. Yeah. So if that was going to be my reflection there. To you, you started off by saying, "I'm very lucky. I'm self-employed," and then you named four mm-hmm. jobs. Oh, and, there's more than that. I mean, and, yeah, and at least two of those jobs, the the work days are diametrically opposite to our work days. It's their night and well, our day. <laughs> yeah, they are. Yeah, but you know, this is no sob story. It's it's been a challenging. Well, I started our first business when I when when was it 2004, right? So I've been doing this getting on for 20 years, and it's been a roller coaster, right? Of success and the highs of success and the very very deep dark lows of it's not success let's call it right and everything in between so but it overall i enjoy it and i thrive on it and i I do enjoy the pressure and the stress and the challenge of all these different plates but yes you wake up to emails from australia and you go to bed from emails from australia you know you can't there's no escaping it really yeah um but training can be done around it because i manage my own time and I don't really have anyone to answer to other than obviously myself and business partners, really. So uh, it's not as challenging as it might seem at times when, you know, it has its moments, obviously. And then travel, which is obviously not an issue this year, but normally I travel quite a bit, Mm. Um, predominantly Australia or or America, really. Um, But and then that can, you know, like anyone you've got a training peaks plan to follow and then all of a sudden you've got to go away for a week, two weeks. It's not easy, is it? Cause you haven't got all your kit with you and you've not got a gym or whatever. Uh, but it's overall doable. So let's talk about how you manage it then. How do you do it? Cause it, it sounds uh, complex and I know, I know how you do it, but like for people it, who are listening, how do you, how do you go about managing to fit your training into a standard week when you haven't got a standard week and things change overnight and you wake up in the morning and things are very different to how they look the day before? Well, you, I mean, I like to think that I'm becoming, I'm having a healthier approach and mindset to it than I started out with, which was, can't do it today, move it to tomorrow. Can't do that tomorrow, move it all on to Sunday and just do a whole week <laughs> in one day. Right? And, and you, you, you slowly but surely breaking through, breaking, uh, breaking that down on me, which is great. But you just got to, uh, you, if it's there to do and you want to do it and you're doing it for the right reasons, you just got to do it, haven't you? There's no, I'm a very black and white person, Rob, as you know. It's like, well, if it's on your training plan to do and you want to do it, it's your choice. No one's forcing you to do this training. You've signed up. Go and do it and stop moaning about it. Like, I, yeah, I struggle with, um, I, I'm, I'm my own worst critic, let's say. I'm very, very hard on myself. Like, nothing's ever good enough, right? And, and that's another okay. thing you're working on with me, as you know. So if I miss a session when I know that I could have done the session, but I just couldn't be bothered, I'm very, uh, I'm very tough on myself for that. Um, and I'm not very good at giving myself, or allowing myself a reason. I was about to say excuse, so that I knew I know that you'd shake your head. So it's not an excuse; it's it's a genuine thing. But if it's physically time in the day, why well, just do it? Um, so how I manage it, I don't know. Probably just stubbornness would be the answer. <laughs> I don't know if that's what you were thinking the answer was, but that's how I see it. Just you signed up to do it, so just do it then. Good man. That- right, so I'm at UK then. Talk us through race day. That's what everyone wants to hear the the cherry on the cake. So you start at 100 kilos in 2010, and then yeah, yeah. So uh, race day morning for Ironman UK. Well, race day morning uh, was me and Heaps eating our overnight oats in my kitchen at four o'clock in the morning because I, I managed. So ordinarily, he's convincing me and bullying me into sign up to these things. Well, I man, I managed to convince him to do it as well, which was awesome. 
so we did the, we did a lot of our training together which was a mixed blessing because he's uh he's a freak on a bike let's say so trying to follow him on a bike when you train is not ideal but um but yeah so so it was overnight oats four slows down at four o'clock in the morning get to tran you know set up uh and then wait around and then you know you bump into various people who you know or you've seen or you know try and keep the nerves at bay as best as possible and and genuinely for me anyway it was a bit of uh blind naivety of not really knowing what what was coming outside of well, i've done an olympic and that's fine and i know the crowds at ironmans are great but really i don't know what it's like to keep going for 12 hours or 13 or 14 or however long it's going to take um and then before you know it you're listening to acdc aren't you you're like right this is it then <laughs> off i go and it's just incredible isn't it as an experience it's it's got to be up there with one of the most intense amazing things i've ever done you know uh did it go to plan no not at all but it, i don't think it ever does does it for anyone swim was a little bit slower and choppy and more violent than i would have liked transitions as i'm known in the team are comically slow you know like <laughs> I think my combined <laughs> my combined transitions at Ironman was just shy of twenty minutes. I think so. So there's a bit to work on there, maybe. Um, the bike was it's a tough course, isn't it? It's a tough, yeah. tough cold route. Um, it's got to so, be one of the toughest and most, especially the new one, the most underrated. Yeah. In terms of it doesn't it doesn't look like much on paper, but in reality, it is it, so it's difficult. Just unrelenting. Yeah. yeah, it's just. It's just absolutely leg sapping because there's no, le- they don't, there never feels like a good section where you can just tuck in and just enjoy the, you know, enjoy the momentum that you've built on the speed. So you're always digging away at it. So, and then you come to the run and, you know, so I remember coming into T2, a bit shell shocked, did a decent bike split. It was, it was a little slower than I was expecting, but that's fine. And then I came out of the tent, having spent 10 minutes, you know, showering and in my hair and you know <laughs> um came out and my dad was stood just outside of the uh, of the transition and he looked at me and was like right ready to go and i was like i, was, I could barely walk i was like dad i honestly don't know what i'm gonna do I could, I, there's no way i could run a marathon there's just no way he's like right just and i could see in his face he was thinking well i don't know what to say to you here so he's like why don't you just try walking to the first aid station it's only up that hill I was like, yeah, I'm going to have to do that. So I sort of walked and hobbled and I'm dealing with all sorts of cramp and mind games, really. You know, men, my mind's telling me that it's not doable. And I, I got some water or whatever. I think I had some crisps or something. And I thought, I'll just, I'll just put one foot in front of the other and just try jogging. And then to your point where, you know, you just mentally you just go, I'll just break it down. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm probably not going to do it. I'm probably going to stop, but I'll just see. So I just did that. And then off I was then and then after 20 minutes or so I was in my groove and shuffling along all right you know and then um a guy on the team on our team Ollie who had seen on the bike uh I, I went past him on the bike and he'd done he he so back, well not backstory but pre-swim he, he was like don't look so nervous mate this is the best day of the year he, Ollie was like forever smiling if you remember he's just always smiling always upbeat always happy and I must have had a look of fear on my face. I was like, mate, you're going to love it. Honestly, it's brilliant. So I didn't see him again on the swim. And he's faster than me. And then he was out on the bike. And then I eventually caught him on the bike. And he was still smiling. And I was in the depth of hell, like putting out ridiculous watts too high. And he was like, mate, just calm down. It's fine. It's fine. And anyway, off I went with him shouting, I'll see you on the run. <laughs> it's like, yeah, probably you will. And lo and behold, there he was. And then for the for the entire marathon, we just kept sort of catching up to each other. And then he was in, he, he had some, some uh, pain in his leg and he was really struggling. So then we ended up just pulling each other around the run and then pretty much crossing over the line together. It was, it was amazing, really. It was awesome. It was really good. So as a, as a felt more like a, a team event yeah. because of it, you know, and it was, it was, uh, yeah, it was really good. It was really special. I enjoyed it. Camaraderie is great, isn't it? When you, when you it's really brilliant. suffer through something with somebody. Yeah, really, really good. And that's been, you know, you know say towards the end but that's been the a real revelation of being part of this team never been a team sp- sports person as i said but this makes you feel like you're part of something and it makes the whole thing so much more enjoyable yeah it really does it's, it's incredible it's special so yeah so that was um that was iron man really uh got over the line caught up with heaps who just 
<laughs> I'm sure he won't mind me saying he'd just come out of the medical tent. So, you know, it was my turn to laugh and point instead of him. Uh, and then immediately just wanted to do another one and sign up again. You know, that was it. I was, I was in. I got my medal. I was an Iron Man, and, and it wasn't enough. I wanted to do more, which has got to be a good sign, I suppose. Yeah. You know? And so it's off to Copenhagen for, for a slightly different experience on a... Well, I mean, you know. spoke with yourself, obviously, signed up with you. And, and yeah, it was very much right. Where, where the, what do you enjoy about the, the three bits of it? Where, where's your strengths? And I think my strengths lie in the bike. Well, oh, I, yeah. don't, I don't think. I know yeah. they do. And I think the strengths of the bike... Biker. Are, I'm, I'm, thanks. I'm all right. And, but I think something like Copenhagen probably plays to my strengths more than mm. on the hills, perhaps. So we'll see. I'm, I'm excited by it. But, you know, obviously... It wasn't to be this year, so I've just got another year of training under belt ready for next year, haven't I, really? Um, and this year has been mixed for all sorts of reasons, hasn't it? So. Well, I think, yeah, this is a this will be an interesting segue, I think, for the listeners, because at this mm. point we've we've done the kind of the the triathlete gets back in shape, completes Ironman part of the story, which yeah. which would be a great story arc for most podcasts. But at this point, we're gonna kinda go into <laughs> podcast oh. story part two. Yeah. Um so bit of drama and excitement i'm going to let you tell the story but you and your boys you and your boys decide you're going to go and have an expedition to alaska yeah so forgive me if i start getting all weepy on this right so this is um this this is quite uh it'll be challenging this but well well it is it's a serious thing isn't it because i mean yeah it is it is but should we we preface it by it 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 ends well let's preface it with that Worry not, listener. You know, all is all's good. But uh, yeah, it's it's a full on. It was a full on experience to me, anyway. Yeah. So so yeah, we. So as I said, the, we've got businesses in various parts of the world, and as our collective businesses have grown and changed, a group of six or seven of us are all really good friends, of all scattered around in various parts of the world. So we've always sort of said, let's and we when we share um, various investments together and things. So. There's always a reason to meet up when we can, right? So what we've tried to do, as much as anything, to justify it to our our better <laughs> halves at home. Oh well, we're meeting up in you know wherever it might be, Canada, Whistler, uh, Vegas, as a as a work meeting, right? But we'll always try and tack on something fun at the end of it if we can. And over the years, we've done some amazing things. You know, we've been to Vegas for the boxing, we've been skiing, we've been, we've done all sorts, right? We're really lucky, and it's been brilliant. Uh, and a couple of years ago, 2018, we decided to book this um, four-day motorbike riding and camping under the stars at night through Yosemite. And it was unbelievable. It was amazing, right? I mean, it's an adventure, but it's a safe adventure for office workers, basically. Yeah. So you've got support vehicles following you. You've got a chef and campsite. You know, I mean, it's like ridiculous, but amazing. Really good experience. Really enjoyed it. It was just the right amount of of edgy fun right without it being a risk and a danger you know so you've got you know riding motorbikes yes it's dangerous but it's safe as can be and then you get to camp put your tent up and then some chefs making you amazing food you know it's like <laughs> it was brilliant really good fun and if Carlsberg did adventure trips right it's exactly that and i think that that statement was even used right so so we had we had that under our belt and we're like right a couple of years later let, let's let's book something again and we're like, well, let, we don't want to, you know, sometimes people chase after the same thing. So you book it again thinking it's going to be special and it's not. And you end up ruining the first experience because you've tried to replicate it, right? So look, let's stick with the same company, but just switch it up a bit. And they did a similar type of experience, but on skidoos in Alaska. All right? And I thought, wow, what an experience that'll be. Marketed and sold is basically the same thing. Obviously not camping under the stars, but you, you're in a in a lodge and there's, there's catering and there's a show, you know, it's all that that you want it to be. Right. Uh, and you've got a professional guide that's worked in Alaska for 20 years doing this and all that. And you're like, well, you know what, this sounds amazing. It's going to be fun. You, you're in the Alaskan wilderness. You've got the, the night sky, you've got the nature, you, all that. It sounds perfect. It looks brilliant. Website was amazing. So we booked it for uh, late February of this year. So yes. So we're in Whistler and we get a flight up to Anchorage to meet our, um, our guide. Yeah, and it's and then from there it's a four hour journey, a four hour drive into the you know into nowhere basically. So it's exciting, and we're like, wow, the, you know. So a couple of years ago in 
in Yosemite, we meet the guides and they're like amazingly cool guys, all live in LA and they're just brilliant, awesome pe- people to be around. Our Alaska guy picks her up, picks us up, and it's like he's the grumpiest, most massive human I've ever seen. Zero humor, non appreciative of our banter, and like just it's quite a scary individual guy. And we're like, oh, this is this sounds this feels different. And he was just we just couldn't get anything out of him. And, and we're like, well, yeah, we're just, you know, a bunch of beginners up for a bit of fun and experience and we're looking forward to the challenge. He was like, beginners, this is not a beginner experience. It's like almost offended. You know, this is an extreme adventure in, in the middle of Alaska. We're like, well, that's not what we book, mate. He went, well, that's what it is. But don't you worry. I'll get you through it. I've not failed. I've not failed yet. I was like, we should have known them. I mean, we should have been pulling the plug immediately. But you don't, do you? You're a bunch of six, seven lads who are, camaraderie no one wants to say i don't want to do this i'm too scared so we sort of like we did talk i remember talking about going this doesn't feel right you know like where's the fun this seems more like a endurance effort but we're in you know we're in we made the effort to get to anchorage for god's sake like let's let's crack on so i wake up the following morning in this dodgy lodge i have the worst breakfast known to man uh scrabble around trying to find kit that will fit us you know and even the guy even this Derek guy is saying look the equipment's a bit crappy like but you've got to make sure it fits because if it doesn't you're going to be in serious trouble <laughs> we're experiencing the coldest weather and the deepest snow drifts we've seen in decades we're like Wait, <laughs> hang on a minute this this isn't right so anyway after the briefest of safety briefings off we go and immediately the people are falling off left right and center right and we're falling in we're, we're driving into the snow drifts we're coming off it was just carnage right and, and about an hour in we sort of tried we're getting the hang of it but it's not easy and because of the conditions it's very difficult to keep these things on on the path on the, the i was gonna say is it hard to drive a skidoo really hard because i don't think the, anyone in the uk will have driven one will they have seen them in movies yeah but... i mean it's awesome but but they're really you know obviously if you turn right unlike a bike you don't immediately turn right do you it takes time for the, for the ski the skis to kick in oh you know? i see yeah you know? so so you, there's a skill to it and it's all about body weight and then but then if you've got massive snow drifts basically encroaching on the path that's being pre rode in if you like makes it very difficult and the second you catch some loose snow you're off and right these things weigh a ton. it's like Literally. trying to ski through powder when you've exactly. just learned to ski on, when on a paste yeah, right like yeah okay going, taking your heli skiing when you've just like learned the snow plow you know like it's, it's very difficult so Derek's like losing his patience with us and sh- basically shouting at us and it turns out the other guy that they brought along with him uh only occasionally rides a skidoo and and barely done any in the last five years and there's us seven in the middle going well they, what the hell are we doing here? Yeah. So we're, we're, we're ambling along at not a very, uh, not a very, um, what would you say, progressive speed. And it's getting later in the day. Derek stops us. He's like sick of shouting at us. Gives us our, our lunch, which genuinely was two slices of dry bread with a piece of processed cheese and ham in it. Right. And I, I'm no nutritionist, but even <laughs> I know that that's not going to, that's not going to, fuel you for a 12 hours skidoo trip in minus 40 odd degrees temperature is it you know oh well this isn't good oh and the other sound advice he gave us well don't overfill your water bottle because it'll freeze so we all went out with half water bottles assuming that your lead guide is you know well catered and well well prepared no he hadn't brought any provisions whatsoever and hadn't even brought a snow shovel so we, we had and every time we came off we had to use our hands to like, you know, dig a hole to then write the machine to get back on it. So the whole thing was just a disaster, right? And we got to this, he stopped us and said, right, we're running. I've never had a slower group. I'm like, well, thanks a lot. You know? <laughs> it's getting dark, it's getting colder. And we're at, the, we're at a turning point where either turn back and go back to the lodge where we were, or we, or we push on to the lodge where we're meant to be going. And we're not turning back because that's not what I do. Right. And we're like, are you sure about this? And you've got, at the end of the day, you, you're completely out of your comfort zone. You're tired, you're wet, you're cold, you're annoyed, both at yourself but also at the situation. You have to trust the people you've paid to take you out, don't you? So yeah. we just went, okay, Derek, if that's what you think's best. So off we go, and then the, the weather just turned almost on a diet. It, it was scary. It went pitch black very quickly. Uh, it dropped down to, I think it was minus 46 maybe at, at its coldest. 
which is minus you know, 46. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, blizzards and oh, it, it, wind, it was all going off, right? And we'd been going another two hours, uh, falling off even more because of, you know, the conditions were just so horrific. Our goggles were freezing over, so we couldn't see. So we had to take the goggles off and, and you know, sort of ride whilst shielding your eyes because your eyelids were freezing so you couldn't see that. It was just a disaster. Hang on, mate. We've lost your sound again. I think there's something... There must be a loose connection or something. Are you perfectly? No. There we go. Yeah, you're back again. All right. Don't I move. move. I won't move. So, so yeah, so we're, we're, we're trying to make our way slowly through, through to this lodge. Weather's getting worse. We're getting more and more tired. Uh, and, and, and eventually, Derek stops and said, right, coming up, there's a, it's what's called an overflow. Now, I still don't know how this works, but it's minus 40 odds, yet it's free-flowing water. It's, yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it's a mystery to me. He said, <laughs> he said, whatever you do, you cannot come off as you go in over this overflow. You cannot come off. So obviously, what do you think happened? <laughs> off we go. And it's like wacky races. We're, we're all flying <laughs> off left, right and center, right? And I had to stop because the guy in front of me came off. So, and there's only, it's a narrow path. So you have to stop and help. So as I get off my machine to go and help, my, my both boots filled up with water. Oh. So, yeah. So immediately I'm thinking, well, that's it. Like, obviously that's the end of my, well, it could, it could be the end of a lot of things, but I know having water in that temperature that far away from civilization is not a good thing. Same happened to Ben with his fingers, with one of his gloves. Same happened to Ant, uh, who, who uh, well, 2017, I ran the New York Marathon with him, and he's done 20-odd marathon. Right? He's a really passionate runner. He got water in his boots, and we were just looking at each other, thinking, well, that, you know, we're, we're in a serious world of trouble here. Eventually got over this, um, uh, this, this water area, and then Derek decides that he's going to have to go off and find a route to this emergency lodge because we're not going to make it. Right? Mm. The path's totally covered. Um, it stops snowing, but you know, it's so cold. You can barely open your eyes and you know, it's not looking good. And Derek's changed from being this really aggressive bloke to almost overly kind and supportive. It's purely panic. He's, mm. he's panicking for us thinking, well, we're not going to make this. So, so he decides to go off, right. And find a path to a lodge where we don't know where it is. We don't know where we are. We don't see him. We're like, well, what, what do we do? So we, we, amble along for a bit, then get lost, can't see his tracks anymore. And we we'll, we'll, we'll literally, I've never known isolation like it, you know, outside yeah, of this I can believe. Uh, group. You're looking around, incredible light sky, right? Very beautiful, but very scary. Yeah. And, you know, I, it must have been sort of nine, ten at night. I'm like, right, lads, what do we do here? By this point, my, my, my boots have frozen solid. I can't feel my feet. I can't wiggle my toes. So my, my feet are just in a box of ice, basically. Same thing's happening with lots of other people. We've all got like wind chafe on our cheeks from the wind and, you know, can't see properly. We're having to prise our eyes open. We've run out of water. We've no food. We're having to snap the ice, genuinely snap the icicles off our beards or wherever we've, we've, to eat it for water. So it's a desperate situation, right? Uh, then we, so we tried calling emergency you know, evac in, who told us that because of the temperature, the only helicopter that could come and get was is a Chinook, which they don't have. So we're on our own. But they will try their best to get in touch with any local lodges. They know roughly where we are because they know the guide and his routes, but we couldn't pinpoint where we were because nothing was working. So we're like, right, what, what do you suggest we do? We said, well, <clears throat> there's only really three things you can do, which, you know, is obvious. You either sit there and wait it out, um, and hope and pray that you, your vehicles don't stall because if they stall, they might not restart. But if you wait, if you wait, you're obviously going to run out of fuel eventually. Yeah. So, or secondly, you can dig snow holes and wait it out till morning and you'll be slightly warmer than you are now, but you'll definitely be looking at limb loss. Oh my God. Yeah. Or third, you can sort of head off in the general direction of where you think your guide's gone in the hopes that at some point, you'll bump into him or a track or something. And, and even they were, you know, like, I know that's not a great choice, but that's all you can do. 
So we were like, right, well, I mean, you know, it's very cliched, but it's so true. You, you literally see your life flash before your eyes. All you can think about is your kids back at home and your wife and your friends and yeah. why am I so stupid? Why am I doing these things? Why have I done this? But then you're having to constantly check yourself, say, well, I didn't sign up to this. This is not my fault, you know. Um, so in, in, anyway, we, we, we almost voted on it, right? We, we took a vote of what do you want to do? And there was only one choice, really. You, you've got to carry on, haven't you? You've got to move forward. So yeah. collectively, we said, right, let's just head this way. Oh, that was it. <laughs> I forgot about this bit. So we, we each tried to call home before we set off in the, let's say, 50-50 chance, we thought, of survival. So we thought, well, at least let's try and say bye to our family. Oh, God, Gaz, yeah. I, I didn't know it was. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Man. Um, but phones weren't working. Because it's right. too common, so the batteries are gone. So we're like, that insult on injury. Like, I can't even say bye bye. So anyway, so off we go, and um, we just carried on for an hour or so, stopping periodically to let everyone catch up and group huddles and you know group support type of thing. And then that's where everyone's personalities really came through. You know, like it, it was a real team effort because everyone's different and deal with things differently, don't they? You know, obviously you've got the the stronger types who go, come on, going this way, we can do this lads to the people that need the support and like, we're not going to make it. And what about X and what about Y and what about the family? You know, and, and we had it all from all of us at various points, utterly convinced at one point that we, we would, we were basically going to freeze out there and die. You know, it's mm. very surreal and, and obviously upsetting. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, an hour, it must've been an hour. It, it must've been, uh, and then we see these lights in the distance and it almost like, a, uh, yeah, almost like a film. You go, it can't be real. It can't be real. You know? And it was, it was pretty Derek and these two guides that he'd found at this lodge coming back. Oh, so wow. it's, it's a genuine miracle that we were on a roughly similar path to where Derek had gone. Cause we could have literally like pointed in any one direction and gone, well, let's go that way, you know? So, so yeah, back he came and then we had another hour or so of just basically doing everything we can just to stay upright and get to this emergency lodge, which we eventually got to. And then just that feeling of collapsing in the, in this warm, well lit, you know, comfortable lodge was just unbelievable. Uh, but that was then just the start of the hell to follow, you know, in terms of the thaw out and trying to get the boots and gloves and everything else off, you know, but we got there and no one died and, uh what followed was just miserable so so the first thing that i know of this as coach is i get a text from you you're off on your happy jolly adventures as far as i know and i get text of what i initially assumed was some kind of laddish japes as as like your face is contorted as the boys are trying to pull your boots off and it very quickly it very quickly (laughs) becomes apparent that we've got like a serious situation going on and so how did you guys get out of there were you were you evac that evening how, oh god no no they couldn't get to us so, so I you're mean, still the, in the lodge you feel in the lodge completely frozen hour, solid yeah it took an hour to get the boots off they were using hair dryers and all sorts to you know defrost mine and Ant's boots and, and ben's glove and honestly mate the, the adventure got these but i was telling them to stop pulling because i was utterly convinced that they were going to snap my feet off so your feet were literally frozen. Well, they, 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 the they, boots, they cut the socks block. off. They cut, yeah. cut them off, and my feet were the 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 texture and feel of knocking on wood. Oh my god! And the color of snow, right? And I was like, "Well, that's that, that's them gone." I couldn't, you know, I couldn't move them. If I knocked them on the floor, they made it like a you know knocking noise type of thing. I, I couldn't like, well, feel them at all. No, not 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 at all. They, they literally felt frozen solid through. I thought, well, that's, that's that then. And then, you know, the looks of concern from everyone, uh, including the, the lodge staff, you know, who's seen a lot of shit over the years, let's say. <laughs> and I thought, oh, no. And they were like, no, I think you'll be all right. I think we've caught it in time, I think. And it was all think, and I reckon, you know, and it was like, well, so I was freaking out, as was we all were for obvious reasons. But, yeah, I, I probably didn't handle it very well. Um, and then that thought, <laughs> I think you probably yeah. did. I think you should. Well, you should give yourself a little bit of a gap yeah, here and I a told, pat on the back. Because well, I told you, I'm my own worst critic, mate. So, <laughs> <laughs> so then you, you you suffer from cold hands, if you know. You know, you know when you warm up and there's that pins and needly feeling as your fingers warm back up. It's called the hot aches and windsurfing when it goes from Is being it? numb right. 
yes. to all of a sudden feeling as though there's a blowtorch going across That's your skin. It. It's excruciating, yeah. isn't it? Right? Yeah. It's so hard, to, that. hard to describe how yeah. painful that it's, is, isn't it? Exactly, exactly that. So I had that for 12 hours. Oh, right. my I'd God. One, 12 hours. I mean, it was, I was, me and Ant were literally Just rolling screaming. around yeah. on, on our back, you know, almost like you've got permanent cram, you know, when you're like... Yeah, yeah just grabbing it and you just can't believe the pain. It was just unbelievable. And same with Ben, bless him. And, um, and well, we all had very, you know, everyone, all, everyone's cheeks were wind burnt and noses were scabbing over and it was just, just miserable, mate. Anyway, the next morning we start making calls to, to see what our options are, you know? And then the insult to injury was our guide and that company refused to pay for an evac. We had to pay for our own <laughs> rescue, which, which we still not got our money back for, right? But I mean, just ridiculous. But anyway, long story cut short, uh, they went and made a runway out on the snow at this lodge, and then two planes came in and flew us back to Anchorage. Wow. Straight to the hospital, who took an assessment and basically said, Well, it's too early to tell what the longer term damage is going to be, but you've all got frostbite. Your feet are knackered, your feet are knackered, and Ben, your hands really knackered, and you need to prepare yourself for uh, amputation. So, oh. yeah, yeah. So then we spent the rest of the day and the night in Anchorage. Um, oh, look, this is, right, if there was ever a story of human spirit, this is a beautiful story, right? So we go to this bar and we're all wrapped in bandages and feeling sorry for ourselves and just shell shot sat around this table, right? And um, just reliving it, but trying to be positive because, you know, we're still trying to process what the hell has just happened. Yeah. We're really dead 24 hours ago, you know? And, um, and obviously our phone's now working and our wives are getting in touch and, you know, all that. And uh, this this couple came over. The two girls came over from New York. And went, do you mind if we just perch on the end of this table? Because we're on a big table. What you can do, but we apologise for what you might hear and what we might, you know, sporadic, random burst into tears and stuff. You know, yeah. re- reliving it. Anyway, we get to go and pay. And these two amazing girls had obviously been listening to our story, right? And they'd just gone and paid our bill. And just really? said nothing and gone. And like, bless them. How amazing is that? So we're like, it really is, wow, isn't it? yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a little thing like that it tipped us all over the edge. We were like sobbing as we were getting our coats at this bar. <laughs> it's uh, ridiculous. Anyway, day after we then uh, arranged flights home, and I was going to come home until Andy's wife, Jess, who's an, anaesthet- uh, who's an anaesthetist, obviously in medical, said, "What the hell are you doing? You need to go straight to hospital." So, so I landed and went straight to Withenshaw Burns Unit, and they admitted me for three days, like straight away you know and i was like a little celebrity in there because it's rare you see frostbite <laughs> i guess in in manchester isn't it? you know yeah so i had everyone call in to have a good gawk at what what was going on and and that's when all the blisters came out and all the horrible stuff that you've seen on on, yeah. on whatsapp started happening and yeah i mean and, and know, on behalf of everyone like, listening i'd like to thank you for forwarding those photos yeah, on you're welcome yeah <laughs> yes you're welcome i did a race report didn't i and i was like from you know from the depth of despair through to race success and the pictures I did, I should have thought about it really before I posted them, but um, <laughs> yeah, it's not pleasant. Let's put it that way. Uh, well, and it's, then, it's hard yeah. to describe, isn't it? How, how your feet looked when you, when we complete yeah. the story arc and we say that was February, obviously mm. you've landed about what, three weeks before COVID yeah. properly kicks yeah, off this year yeah, and all the hospitals yeah. basically go into lockdown right, yeah. to, to yeah. go through your recovery and end up, being able to complete Outlaw X from feet that were looking like, I mean, from feet that were solid white blocks of wood yeah, yeah. in Anchorage. Well, yeah. So have I mean, you looked look, in Withenshaw? It's unbelievable. Yeah, I've been very fortunate in terms of recovery. We, we did catch it in time. I did the right things. Thank God Jess told me to go to hospital. You know, um, the debriding process was just next level horrific, where they, you know, clean your feet and all that, and dead skin. So. But it was all worth it because we got on top of it and the treatment mm. was put in place. And then, yes, I had to leave the hospital because of COVID and I had to sort of change my own bandages and that sort of thing. Yeah. But I mean, how's this for a surreal story? Ben, who had similar problems, but with his hand in Australia, they, they had to sort of, uh, he had to check out the hospital as well and go home. And they basically said to him, look, mate, it's not looking good. At some point, whilst you sat at home, your fingers are going to fall off. When they do, give us a call and we'll tell you what to do next. I mean, that's like... That's next level, isn't it? So, which, so it didn't quite happen. He, he managed to go into hospital and have it done properly, but that was the reality of COVID and what the consequence might be by not being allowed to be in hospital. 
Wow. Yeah. So yeah, so the, 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 the recovery started whatever, end of March was it, beginning of April, and then me and you got together and said, Right, what, what are we gonna do here? And then, you know, you, mate, if you don't mind me so saying so, we're, we're was a, a massive and major part of my recovery. So thank you for that. I mean, you, you held me back as much as anything to say, look, look, just just be happy with the walk, mate, and don't worry about running and you know, forget about swimming. Just can you turn the pedals over? Right, we'll do 10 minutes. And then you know, me being me, like, no, I need to do it, you know, 100 percent FTP for an hour. You're like, no, I think I think what you want to do, mate, is, you know, can you put your trainers on and, and start slow and and build? And for someone like me with zero patience, that's not easy, you know. So I've needed the likes of yourself and the team and oh, all manner of people to get me to where I've got back to. Um, but yeah. It's- Is it interesting reviewing back and talking the whole thing, th- whole thing through how obviously when you're living in the moment, it mm. at every stage along your recovery, it becomes, oh, my feet are too sore to run. That's an annoyance. Yeah. yeah. And we're actually kind of going, it's actually bloody great that you can. It's amazing. Any- yeah. I love feet pain. I love it. I don't love it because – the, the, yeah, the the, out, the, out, the outcome of this whole episode is I've got, I've got both feet, I've got all my toes, I just can't feel various parts of it, and my feet have changed shape because of the swelling. But I can work around it, right? And it's not ideal, and my feet and hands get very cold very quickly. But I've, I say again, I've still got my feet, and I can run. Right? Whereas yeah. in, at the end of March, I was being told that I might not have feet. Or beginning yeah. of March, sorry. So, I mean, I've got to be lucky. I've got to be f- feeling fortunate for that. So yeah, when I get feet pain now, my initial reaction is yes, I can feel something, which is you know odd. And then I get annoyed and go, <laughs> but, but, um, my, but yeah, I, I do genuinely like the fact that I can feel my feet. And if they're hurting, then so much the better because it means my nerves are working. Yeah, you know, right. Which is crazy, isn't it? But there you go. That's the yeah and so the season you know we'll fast forward through a, through a the gradual recovery i suppose mm. but yeah to, to get you back to the point where you actually well, complete outlaw x to finish the year off it's... I, I dip so i dipped my toe at max six which was the event you and andy put on which was awesome because it was my first real test of can i do these things yeah i won't say competitive because you know i'm a very trying triathlete and i'm not podium i'm not going to podium but i'll get through stuff and i did it uh, I could swim and my feet didn't give me too much pain in the cold water. I would bike fine. And then I ran and I managed to run for two hours straight. I didn't set any records, but I ran for two hours straight, you know, and that was amazing. So that was like a huge mental release. If you like, uh, I was yeah. quite emotional after that run because I was like, I'm back, you know, I'm back yeah. to level anyway. Yeah. And then it's just got better from there. Um, and you know, did outlaw obviously and various other things we, we did, uh, Fred Witten, didn't we? So that was, I mean, that, that was off almost zero training, having not done anything since February in Alaska, and to almost, not quite, but almost a, do you fancy riding the, red, the Fred tomorrow? And like, yeah, go on then. You know, and, and that went all right. You know, so yeah. stuff like that that makes you go, well, I'm capable of doing perhaps more than I realise. You know? To be fair, you did have my sorry ass to drag around the Fred, which, which tempered anybody's, <laughs> anybody's ambitions of going fast. <laughs> Well, maybe, but we also had Andy at the opposite end, so, you know. It, it is, you're right, though. It's, it's great to kind of go, like, you can come back from the depths of, you know, no, I don't care how injured somebody is right now. Yeah. They're yeah. very probably not as injured as you were. To get back to the point where you go, right, let's go and ride the Fred tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. And to be able to do it shows you how much fitness your body hangs on to and how much almost, like, fitness memory your body hangs on to. I, I, I made you know, a let's go and do it. I made a note of this because I think it's really important. I genuinely believe with the program that we follow and the training that we do, I don't think people appreciate just how much fitness you, you carry just in general day-to-day life. And had I not had that, I dread to think what the outcome in, in um, Alaska might have been because fitness and that mental strength, if you like, that triathlon training and your plans puts into you and forces you to do is, is significant, you know, and that, you must keep going. You must persevere. And, you know, it, it's a huge part of it. And I, I yeah, I, the hundred kilo Gaz Whittle from former years might not have uh, had the same outcome that this version has. Let's put it that way. It's interesting. So, that, isn't yeah, it? No, I, I really believe that. So, 
so yeah things like the thread are, are a welcome challenge for me now and as are anything else going forward because you know <laughs> whilst the, whilst the uh, Langdegla dia- triathlon was still the worst that ever could be <laughs> conceived in terms of effort Alaska wasn't far behind it <laughs> So yeah, for me, mate, it's you know, Outlaw was done. I really enjoyed that. The guys did a, 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 an amazing event, um, given everything that's gone on this year. And then it's on to Copenhagen next year. Yeah, so I'm, I'm sort of, I'll, I'll touch with what else to say, but I'm back. I think. Yeah, I think I'm back. You know, which is exciting. And just share before we wrap this up the, yeah. the story of you and Ant doing your marathon. Oh yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. So bless you. So we were meant to be doing the marathon this year as well, and that obviously got. Was it, was it meant to be New York? You meant to New be York, yeah, New yeah. York. And um, this will be Ant's twenty-first marathon. Uh, and he, he, he always said, "I'm going to do twenty-one, then I'm out." Right. And, and his birthday is on the twenty-first of October. So I said, "You know what? Let's let's run it virtually together on the twenty-first. And and cause New York Marathon they put on a virtual event. You get a medal for it and all that. So we uh, we set off. He set off at like four o'clock in the morning his time locally because he lives out in New York. And then I set off at whatever that is, nine o'clock my time. And we just ran around with our headphones on, chatting to each other and ran around our local villages until we'd done the distance. It was, uh, <laughs> and, you know, to be able to do that, given six months prior, we were both in hospital with bandages around our feet in wheelchairs. So it was quite a special moment. It was, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was great. And even better, I was 10 seconds faster than when I did it in 2017. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, no, it, it was great. It was um, a really emotional moment, that, and, and a sort of definite, like, we can put a line under this thing now. Yeah. I, th- I think I said, it might be to Nat or to you or someone you know, in the team, I'm not allowed to talk about Alaska anymore. That's it now. I've, I've dined out on it a bit. I've bored people with it. I've used it as a reason an excuse maybe sometimes to not do stuff well that's it now if i can run a marathon and i can do fred witten i can do an outlaw i think i'm over it yeah for the right reasons you know in the right way i'm not downplaying it i'm not i'm not saying i'm not fortunate and uh, (laughs) or otherwise to get through it but i've got to move forward now yeah. And that's the plan. And, and, and that comes and across, that. mate. That comes across in, in what you're saying. And I think it's a great example of like healing fully. Your body's mm-hmm. healed, but mm-hmm. also you've gone through that process mentally and gone, right, there's all these things I've had to resolve and all these things I've got to let yeah. go of and all these yeah. Yeah. emotions that, you know, that's the kind of thing could circle around you for the rest of your life if yeah. you let yeah. it. Or you, you can choose it, yeah. to you can choose to deal with it fully and move on. And it sounds like you've really Really I think I have, mate. You know, like I'm, I'm not waking up with the nightmares anymore, and and seeing the the starry sky and shivering and stuff, which you know I went through, and I'm not feel, I'm not carrying the guilt of not doing more to help. I mean, there's all sorts of things you go through, you know, or or carrying yeah. the guilt of my God, I nearly didn't see my kids again and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, I think we've we've collectively all of us moved forward positively from it. Uh, and definitely, again, cliched, but definitely stronger for it, you know. Um, so I've just got to put that strength to use now. Haven't I? Yeah. Mm. But you know what, mate? That's a, that's a pretty good place to take it to. So, I think so. Next summer, I'm in Copenhagen, October the, I want to say 22nd, is that right? Yeah, it is. October, August, August the 22nd. August, don't scare me, mate. No, August the 22nd. August 22nd, yeah. So that yeah. I'm, I can't wait for that. You know, I'm... Uh, be a fun event i'm sure yeah uh, yeah so let's do it let's see what happens brilliant all right man do you know what that's great thank awesome you chat. so much for oh, sharing man. your story man it's uh it's a it's a mind-boggling story it's... and well done no i enjoyed it and it's great to chat and thank you and thanks for everything you and, and and the team i just want to say thank you to everyone for all your support it's been um very much appreciated and i'm going to get emotional now so oh bless all right, we'll wrap it up. Friday right, right. too. Great to chat. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, right. guys. See you, mate. Bye. Okay, and that brings us to the end of that interview. <laughs> I've got to say, I listened back to the the last ten minutes of that just before I recorded that, and uh, I was getting a little bit choked up at the end there. I think it's it's an amazing story. I'd, I've never known anybody survive anything like that in real life before, and you know, part of me was thinking this is only tangentially related to triathlon. But I just thought, I don't care. It's such a great and amazing and inspiring story. I want to get it out there. So 
I hope you guys have all enjoyed that. Thanks very much, Gaz, for sharing your story with uh, with so much honesty with us. That interview was brought to us by PrecisionHydration.com. Remember, you can get 15% off your first order with the code OxygenAddict15. These guys make electrolytes in different strengths to match how you sweat. So if you're training on the turbo or on the treadmill this winter, you need to stay hydrated. And that's more than just drinking water. It's having the right concentration of sodium and potassium in your blood as well. So get that right in your drink. I'm a particularly salty sweater. I've got a very high sodium concentration in my sweat, so I get terrible cramps on the bike if I don't drink Precision Hydration. You guys get over there and check it out. You can take their online sweat test. They're not doing in-person sweat tests at the moment, but the online sweat test is really good. Uh, You just answer a few questions online and it can give you a really good lead as to whether you're a very salty or very heavy sweater, and in which case you definitely need to be taking good care of your electrolyte concentrations. And you can book a free hydration call with the professionals at Precision Hydration. There's a link in the show notes. You mentioned that you heard about it via the Oxygen Addict Triathlon podcast and you entered into a draw to win a £50 Precision Hydration bundle. All right then, guys, that brings us to the end of this week's show. Here's some discount codes and deals for you. Again, precisionhydration.com. Use the code OxygenAddict15 for 15% off your first electrolyte order. And if you're looking for triathlon coaching to take you into the new season, check us out over at teamoxygenaddict.com. We're the most comprehensive triathlon coaching program out there for busy age groupers. Remember, there's links for all of this in the show notes, so you don't have to remember them. Until next week, have a great safe training and racing week. I'm Coach Rob Wilby. Happy New Year, and you've been listening to the Oxygenatic Triathlon Podcast. See ya.